What's up guys Maelstrom here if you enjoy the video then like, subscribe and leave a comment down below so I can keep on making these awesome videos for you guys. An hour and a half later, Kanaha was gathered around the Hokage Tower, staring up at their leader, who was on top of the building, with an unusually large Umbu escort. As the last of the stragglers shuffled into the courtyard at the base of the tower, the crowd settled down as Tsunade cleared her throat. Citizens and shinobi of Kanaha, today we have regained a long-lost comrade, and he brings us even more comrades, which he has saved from Orokimaru's grasp. Today, we welcome Tewia, Kabuto, and Suzuki Uchiha back into Kanaha. At the first two names, the citizens and shinobi were confused, even more so when the two had stepped forward. However, upon hearing and seeing Suzuki, the village erupted in cheers. After a few minutes of cheering, Tsunade raised her hand, and the crowd slowly calmed down. Ahem. There is still more good news. As many of you, I'm sure, heard, most of Akatsuki has been killed. We have one of our own to thank for this. Before Tsunade could finish, the crowd roared in pleasure and cries of, Way to go Suzuki. And, we knew you were the best Suzuki. Could be heard clearly over and over again. Suzuki stepped forward, and the crowd instinctively went silent once again. You fools. I am not the one who beat Akatsuki. I am nowhere near strong enough, not even under the guidance I had these past two years. The fact that the man who did used to be from Kanaha must have confused you. He is not yet returning to this village. He has not yet forgiven you. The crowd took offense to this, and many people shouted, What are you talking about? We would never insult someone that strong and noble. Silence. The crowd was quiet once more in an instant, the malice in Suzuki's voice clearly scaring them, even the shinobi. You act as though you are the greatest people on the planet. You're arrogant and selfish, and I'm now surprised as to how this tainted me but not the one we are talking about. I'm tired of dealing with you, I'll let he himself speak now. The crowd watched as Tewia, Kabuto, Suzuki, and Tsunade stepped back, out of sight. Then, they grew enraged at who stepped forward. What is this? Another of your damn pranks, demon. The man's outburst encouraged the crowd, save some of the smarter shinobi. As the crowd got rowdier and rowdier, the umbu were about to mobilize, but the now frowning Naruto held them back. Seeing this, the crowd got scared, fearing the Kyuubai brat had corrupted their leaders. This is no prank. All but three, well, eight technically, of the Akatsuki are dead by my hand. I did so by combining my power with the Kyuubais. You have no reason to fear me, as the Kyuubai is no longer of this world. I can prove it, too. Naruto didn't give the crowd a chance to question him, as he took off his shirt, revealing his torso, and jumped down to one of the lower ledges on the tower. He then brought his hands together, Shadow Clone Jutsu. Five new Narutos popped into existence. Naruto returned his hands to his pockets and released his clones. One of the idiots in the crowd was not convinced, what's that supposed to prove? You just did your damn jutsu like you always do. Others in the crowd began to jeer in agreement. Naruto spoke much more loudly this time, what this prove, my good friend, is that the fourth seal no longer appears on my stomach when I perform jutsu. Ask Jiraiya, he's seen it appear on my stomach before. The mood of the crowd went from angry to remorseful and then to downright murderous at Naruto mentioning Jiraiya. How dare you? Jiraiya died fighting a noble battle against Itaki. One of the crowd members yelled. This rocked Naruto to the very core, and it was evident. Some of the more intelligent people in the crowd, mostly the ones that didn't hate Naruto, picked up on this. The rest of the crowd took Naruto's expression as a sign they had been right, and that he'd been lying. See? I knew it. He was lying, just look at his face. Before the crowd could mobilize against Naruto, Inoichi Yamanaka landed in the front of the crowd, along with Ibiki and two Umbu escorting. Not so fast. I happen to believe Naruto, and I'm willing to put my mind on the line by checking Naruto's for any trace of the Kyuubai. This shocked the crowd, and none of them could find any way to discredit the idea. Well then, let's begin. Hawksan, if you would. The hawk masked Umbu next to him nodded, and went through a series of hand seals before yelling, Umbu interrogation jutsu, mind reading dome. A big, white dome encased the tower and its courtyard 
before Inoichi began to glow faintly. The crowd's eyes glazed over, and Inoichi began, Naruto, stand still, please. Ninja art, mind possession jutsu. Inoichi's body slumped to the ground, caught by the other Umbu escort, one in a bear mask. After a moment, the crowd gasped in shock, as they saw Naruto's mind scape, through Inoichi's eyes. Inoichi was standing in a wet sewer, and before Inoichi could start exploring, Naruto had appeared beside him. Don't bother wandering around, Inoichi-san. I have a pretty good grasp on my mind, you wouldn't get far on your own, no offense. I'll lead you to the seal. Inoichi, although stunned by Narchuas' appearance, and then insulted, even though Naruto said not to be, by Naruto's declaration, decided to follow. After what seemed like an eternity, a change became evident in the sewer. The lights got darker, the smell got fouler, and the condition of the walls had begun to worsen. Inoichi could tell they were getting close. After a few more minutes of wandering, they finally emerged in a great room. The room was barely lit, but it was still possible to make out the enormous cage, with only a piece of paper holding it closed. Inoichi stopped, but Naruto continued forward. Naruto reached the gate, and without missing a beat tore off the seal, and let the gate swing open. A small amount of red, demonic chakra seeped out steadily, but Naruto paid it no attention. He strode into the cage, before the gate and barred walls evaporated. Inoichi stood still, stunned, as the room shrank, and brightened. As more and more candles flickered on, Inoichi began to make out the far end of the room. Standing up against the wall, Naruto was staring back at Inoichi. Inoichi finally got up enough nerve to walk forward, slowly examining the now reasonably sized room. Before Inoichi could make it to Naruto, said entity spoke, jarring Inoichi from his observations and thoughts, you should go. This part of my mind is about to collapse and reform itself now that the seal is gone. Here, let me. And with that, Inoichi awoke in his own body. Before any of the villagers could regain consciousness, Naruto signaled a third umbu. The man nodded, and the hawk umbu moved slightly. The glow on Inoichi faded, but the new umbu began to glow instead. The umbu went through a short series of hand seals before yelling, Byakugan. The villagers' eyes glazed over once again, as they saw Naruto's chakra network, with bright blue chakra flowing through it. Some of the more observant noticed a few traces of red chakra in certain areas, too. After several minutes, both Umbu deactivated their jutsu, and the dome faded as everyone's eyes returned to normal. Is that enough proof? Naruto asked irritably. He got no response, but, judging from the grumbles and uncomfortable looks, I'll take that as a yes. Very well, I shall be on my way now, then. And he was gone, but several hundred villagers had been knocked down by a terribly strong breeze that happened to blow the very second Naruto had said his goodbye. Well, now, it seems that the Ninetales and his friends have returned to Kanaha. That makes things much easier now, especially since we were able to secure the eight other Baijuya before he took out the rest of us. Yes, Pain Sama, it is fortunate. With my memories of Kanaha we should be able to find him with ease. Our plans will not be delayed any further. Settle down, Itaki. While you, Konan, and I can take out all of Kanaha with ease on our own, why don't we use this opportunity as intelligently as possible? Payne's question had an unmistakable hint of cunning. What do you mean, leader? Came Itaka's confused reply. What I mean, friend, is that we can test our new subordinates' abilities by having them siege Kanaha for us, creating both a testing situation for them and a distraction for us. Hell, we can grant whoever survives full Akatsuki status. Payne ended his idea with a smirk. Genius. A loud siren woke the residents of Kanaha, as Shinobi scrambled into action, and confused and scared citizens flooded the streets. Word had spread quickly that an attack was now underway on the village, and chaos had ensued. Citizens of Kanaha, please head to the war shelters so the Shinobi have more space to work in. Make your way to the mountain as orderly and as quickly as possible. Tsunade's voice reigned over the village, and brought a small amount of order back to the village, as the confused villagers now had something to occupy themselves with. Shortly after Tsunade's order, a tremendous explosion could be heard and seen at the front gate of Kanaha, and the village's main line of defense actually fell, leaving a 70-foot-long hole in Kanaha's wall. 
Kanaha Shinobi swarmed on what used to be the front gate, as legions of Akatsuki seeped into the exposed village. All around Shinobi were dying, on both sides. As a frightened two-person family stood watching the carnage in horror, three of the enemies dropped down, surrounding them, swords and kunaus at the ready. The young woman let out a scream, as she closed her eyes waiting for the sword to descend, but it never came. She saw three hooded figures grappling the would-be assailants, before columns of sand encased the criminals and ended their reign of terror forever. Ayaman took a looked up, as the three figures let their hoods down, revealing quite possibly the most famous sand squad ever. Gara, Tamari, and Kankuro. Ayam gave the red-haired leader a smile of thanks, which the three happily returned. She then proceeded to pick up her petrified father and ran toward the nearest safe house. TCH. Typical Kanaha, always getting themselves into sieges. Kankuro scolded playfully, before he and his siblings departed at untrackable speeds. Then, to the horror of all the Kanaha shinobi fighting at the front gate, an even bigger explosion could be heard emanating from the wall closer to the Hokage Tower. Before any of the Kanaha forces could mobilize, the wall connecting that section and the remaining section of the front gate fell over into a heap of rubble, leaving half of Kanaha's first line of defense shattered, for the first time since the Kyuubai had attacked. The shinobi at the front gate had no chance to mobilize and head to their leader's aid, for the Akatsuki hordes never seemed to end, and they continually took up all of the Kanaha shinobi's attention. Kakashi, hurry up. Get over to that second explosion site while I evacuate the tower. Tsunade's voice left no room for argument, and Kakashi leapt off into the distance. Several minutes later, Kakashi herself abandoned the tower, in favor of finding whoever had interrupted her favorite time of the night, no shizu hour, with an attack. Those who knew Tsunade well knew that this was an occasion where no one should approach or question Tsunade without a death wish. Apparently, the three slash eight Akatsuki who Kakashi and Tsunade were heading for, didn't know this. As Tsunade and Kakashi landed, they were confronted by the now infamous Pain, Konan, and Itake, the very men who Naruto failed to kill when combined with the Kyuubai. The two groups stared each other down for several moments, before Pain's main body stepped forward, and addressed Kanaha's two strongest ninja, you can stop all this violence in an instant if you hand over Naruto. If not, we will have no choice but to kill you both and decimate your village. TCH. You Akatsuki never did get good intel, did you? Naruto isn't here, hasn't been here for three months now. What, did you guys hear he returned or something? Tsunade barked back. Pain's expression changed into anger, from whatever it was you could call it normally, do not try to deceive us, Hokage-sama. You think we'll just believe what you say? considering your relationship with the Nine Tails container? You make me sick. Just hand him over and end the bloodshed, before I have to. Tsunade sighed in irritation, you just won't give up will you? I'm not lying, Naruto only brought back Suzuki, Tewa, and Kabuto, then left. I haven't heard from him since. Pain's only reply was six punches delivered into several parts of Tsunade's figure, which sent her to her knees. She coughed up blood, and glanced at Kakashi, who was now activating his main Jakua. She struggled back to her feet, regaining her composure. She now knew she had to let her anger go and take this fight seriously, or she'd be dead in an instant. From anywhere in the village, you could see fire, lightning, giant animals, trees, and boulders flying around near the site of the second explosion. It appeared as though the battle was evenly matched, but without being there, no one could tell for certain. By this point in the siege, all of Kanaha's shinobi, even the newest genin, were awake and springing into action. Most of them opted to head for where Tsunade and Kakashi were battling the leaders of Akatsuki. As they neared the remains of the wall, they began to see just how epic this battle was really becoming. The large group of young ninja finally came upon a horrific scene of battle, the sight of which would make most jounin gag. Two dead bodies were burned horribly, and they were impaled by many tree limbs in a vast array of areas. It was impossible to make out whether they were male or female, let alone who they were. Their answer came quickly, though, as Tsunade and Kakshi, who looked like they jumped into a vat of ketchup, then threw around 13 fire hoops, before taking a TiVo, plugged in, and jumping into a pool, appeared on the scene. Second later, the jumped back, as five pains leapt out of the tree lean, followed by Itaki. Tsunade noticed the newcomers, and her heart sank. 
she couldn't let them watch this, or let pain or attack get at them, they'd stand no chance. Even Niji, a Jounin, would be little match for Itaki, and right now Itaki was at nearly full strength and had five pains to back him up. She yelled out to them, as Kakashi covered her, get the hell out of here. No Kanaha ninja are to come near here until this siege is over. Understood. The young ninja almost protested, but Tsunade cut them off, what are you thinking? If me and Kakashi, two of the strongest ninja in Kanaha, are having trouble, what help do you think you could be? Get out of here or else. Tears fell from many of the young ninja's eyes as they nodded, but right as they turned to leap away, they heard the sound of a sword slicing into a chest cavity, and slowly turned their heads around, and the sight that greeted them was truly nightmarish. At the front gate, the waves of Akatsuki seemed to have ended, but hundreds of red clouded black trench coats were still swarming around Kanaha. Suddenly, every Kanaha ninja stopped cold, as did all of the Akatsuki, as a fierce surge of chakra, the likes of which only a few could recognize, but none could compare anything to, flooded the village, and a killer intent fiercer than the Kyuabais itself crippled anyone who it struck. All of the ninja at the front gate started at each other, and came to a silent agreement, there was no use fighting any longer, whoever that is with, wins. The group of Kanaha's new ninja, consisting of the past few years academy graduates along with the rookie 9, minus Naruto, plus team guy looked on in horror as one of Pain's bodies had a sword extending from its hand, and that sword had impaled Naruto through the chest, stopping inches from Tsunade's own chest. Kano Amaru ran forward, tears streaming down his eyes, and Hinata came quickly afterward. Naruto and I I chan Don't die. You can't die, you're the strongest person in the world. Kano Amaru lightly pounded on Naruto's shoulder, trying to stifle his crying. Hinata just looked at Naruto, tears welling up, her heart in the process of breaking, Naruto-kun. In the blink of an eye, Naruto pushed them away, and another sword impaled him as he blocked Pain's aim once again, this time defending Kano Amaru and Hinata. All of Kanaha's ninja looked on even more terrified, as blood covered most of Naruto's clothes, and more flowed out of his mouth, coating his chin and neck. Somehow, Naruto managed to yell at them, get out of here. All of you, he motioned to Tsunade and Kakashi as he said that, I can take these guys on my own, just get back to the village and stop the rest of Akatsuki, and send Suzuki, I'll try to save Ataka for him. Tsunade wouldn't have it, are you insane? You have two swords in your chest and you're bleeding liters of blood every second, you'll be child's play for them. Naruto growled in response, and 15 new Narutos popped into existence, each one picking up two comrades, although two of them had to use both arms for Kakashi and Tsunade, and leaping away, ending any attempts at knocking sense into Naruto. Naruto turned back to Pain and Itaki, and grunted as he pushed the two swords out of his chest. To Pain's satisfaction, the wounds began to heal, although slower than he had thought they would. He smirked as he addressed Naruto, so, you do still have the nine tails inside you. Good, then the rumors of the Kyuabai having died are false. Wrong again, Pain. Naruto spat, the Kyuabai is dead and gone, and so are all the other Baijiryu, the spirits you captured should be worthless at this point. The only reason I can heal is because some of the Kyuabai's chakra still resides in me, and it can regenerate itself to a certain degree, not enough to really help me in a fight, but it can heal me just like it always has, just slower than the Kyuabai did. That should be more than enough, though, to take you out. Stop trying to bluff your way out of this, vessel. Your ludicrous stories are beginning to get on my nerves. Pain's voice, for once, showed emotion. Itaka flinched at the malice that had been accumulating in Pain's voice during his last statement. You never were one to listen, Pain. Fine then, believe me or not, but regardless of what happens here today your plans are over. I dare you to try to use the power of a Baijuyu right here, right now. Naruto smirked as he challenged Pain. Pain only frowned before biting his thumb and going through the hand seals for an obscure summoning jutsu. Inanimate summoning jutsu. He slammed his palm onto the ground, and the all too familiar sequence of kanji flowed from his hand, forming the required sequence and shape to summon. The giant statue began to form, just as it had the last time Naruto and Pain fought. Pain's five bodies and Itaka jumped up onto the still rising statue's platforms, and began their plan. Naruto didn't bother to try to stop them, 
he wanted Payne to realize for himself that his plans were now worthless. It didn't take long for Payne and Itaka to notice that something wasn't right, and Payne growled in frustration, before punching the statue's great face. The statue shattered instantly, and Itaki and Payne jumped down, as the statue began to sink back into the earth. Payne howled in anger, and screamed at Naruto, Damn you! Do you have any idea what you have done? That was the only hope we had of ending war and fighting in this world once and for all. You mean to tell me that you planned to stop violence in the world, by capturing the nine spirits of the Baijuyu, and using that power to make people cower in fear? Naruto questioned in a slightly mocking tone. You ninja are all alike, none of you can understand the world as it is. The only way to stop violence is to show the world that you can be more violent than they can. But since you just keep insisting on ruining my plans, so be it. I'll take away everything you hold dear. Payne yelled out the last part, before he, his main body, was surrounded by his four other bodies, and they began to glow a bright white. The lights seemed to fuse, and then the bodies surrounding Payne began to spin around him. The Payne rocket began to levitate, before shooting up into the sky, knocking Itake and Naruto backward and through several trees. This violent action knocked Itaki unconscious after all the fighting he had gone through with Tsunade and Kakashi. Naruto, however, remained conscious, and saw Pain's rocket gaining altitude steadily. After several minutes, though, the rocket began to arc, and Naruto realized it was starting to descend. He leapt into action, and used his immense speed to arrive back in the village in mere seconds. He wasted no time in creating an army of shadow clones, which he instructed to find any villagers or ninja still in the village and evacuate them, immediately. It took almost ten minutes, but the sheer mass of clones managed to find all the shinobi and civilians of Kanaha and get them outside the remains of the walls of Kanaha. Naruto then performed a jutsu he had never shown anyone before, he made a barrier. As Kanaha's population began to struggle in the hands of the Naruto clones, everyone ceased moving as a giant blue barrier began to form a bubble over Kanaha. As they watched the bubble forming and getting closer to finishing the dome over top of Kanaha, the Kanaha inhabitants finally saw the giant white rocket that was pain. As Akatsuki's remaining foot soldiers looked on, some of the higher ranking ones realized that their leader was sacrificing his self, and quickly relayed the information to the rest of his comrades. As the news spread, Akatsuki's morale evaporated, and the cloaked Nukunin began a hasty retreat. Kanaha's population paid them no attention, as they watched as Naruto's clones began to climb the barrier Naruto was creating. Several Hyuga activated their Byakugans all around the barrier, scouring the area for the real Naruto. They finally found him, standing atop the fourth Hokage's rock head, and the Hyuga who were watching all gasped in awe and fear at what he was forming in his hands. Naruto's army of clones had finally managed to all get onto the barrier, and each began to form its own Rays Non. The ones near the back began to climb onto others, and the sheet of clones began to form a dense cylinder, leaving an area about the size of Payne's rocket in the center, right over the Hokage monument, where the real Naruto was standing. Naruto pulled open his barrier, and leapt up into the sky, before reforming the opened area. He landed in the center of the open area, right as the highest Naruto's began slamming Raisinons into Payne's rocket. Naruto growled in frustration as the Raisingans were being repelled, and then dispelling themselves and their clones. He groaned from strain, as he hoisted his own Raisinon over his head, and began to disperse his clones as soon as they contacted Pain with their Raisinon. The Hyuga watched in awe, relaying what they saw happening to their confused comrades, he's formed a giant Raisinon, and I'd dare say it's nearly the size of the fourth's head. Now he's collecting the chakra that is dissipating from the failed Raisnons and pulling it into his own Raisnon. What happened next, though, shocked and scared every Hyuga that had their Byakugan active, including Hanabi and Hinata. H. He's opened the gates. 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7. He has 7 of the celestial gates opened. The population of ninja stood, watching in awe and horror. Mouths agape as the winds began to pick up and swirl around the dense mass of chakra that stood atop the barrier. The words Hinata spoke next tore Tsunade's heart apart. H he he's pulling chakra out of his muscles to increase the size of his rays non. No. He's pulling even more from his heart and vital organs. And now from every cell in his body. Good God. He's taking every last ounce of chakra he has to power up his rays non. This confused most of the younger 
aka Nanambu or Jounin, ninja, and it was evident. Tsunade let tears fall as she sighed and began to explain, people have two sets of chakra, one set, the set that ninja use in order to perform jutsu, is the surplus that we don't need in day to day life to move and survive. However, the other set, is the set that sustains our bodies and keeps us alive. The second set is normally never needed for ninja, and most can't even access it if they wanted to. This is a good thing, because what Naruto is doing right now, is certain death. The spinning white rocket had finally passed all the Naruto clones, and was now barreling down on the original Naruto. The Hyuga watched in horror as Naruto finished pulling Chakra out of his body at the same instant pain impacted his Super Rays non. A blinding flash encompassed the surrounding area, and the sheer amount of flaring Chakra blinded the Hyuga and knocked their Byakugans off. The Kanaha population had to cover their eyes and slash or turn away to retain their eyesight. Several minutes passed and the flash only barely dimmed. A long distance away, a shinobi captain signaled for his men to move, there's the signal. Move out. A large force of IWA ninja disappeared just as the blinding white flash ended. The flash finally subsided, and Tsunade turned to Hinata, who nodded. She tried to reactivate her Byakugan, but crippled over in pain, as she deactivated her Byakugan. Tsunade ran over to her, and began analyzing her eyes. She sighed in relief, as there was no real damage, but tried to shake Hinata awake. It took several minutes, and several water jutsu, but Hinata finally woke up. Tsunade tried to question her about what happened, and if she saw anything. I I, I wasn't able to see anything. There is so much chakra residue, invisible to the normal eye, but highly painful to the Byakugan eye. It shines just as bright as that flash earlier. I'm sorry, Tsunade Sama. Hinata's weak reply stunned Kanaha's population once again, as the other Hyuga had reported similar problems. Tsunade just looked on at the falling body that fell through the shattering barrier, please be okay, Naruto. Naruto jumped up as pain neared with his white rocket of chakra, feeling the immense pain and strain from having seven of the gates open along with no chakra to support his body. He had to move on pure willpower alone. He cried out, before contacting pain's rocket with his ultimate raise non, forbidden jutsu, Uzumaki raise non. He felt immeasurable pain for several minutes, before he finally blacked out, feeling bliss, not knowing his body was falling hundreds of feet per second toward the unforgiving ground. A nagging thought kept stirring in Naruto's dying brain, and eventually it nagged enough to restart Naruto's body, and Naruto opened his eyes to see the ground of Kanaha speeding toward him. Without even thinking, he formed a raise non by pulling the chakra residue from the air, and finished forming the ball of destruction just in time, as he pushed it into the ground before blacking out once more. The evacuated Kanaha population looked on in fear as the falling body escaped their line of sight, behind the buildings of Kanaha that remained. Milliseconds later, a loud boom was heard, and the earth trembled. Minutes passed, and finally the people of Kanaha seemed to regain their composure. The ninja population hurried back into their war-torn village, ignoring the flaming buildings and crumbling structures in favor of finding who it was that made the giant crater in the center of the village. When they arrived at the last building that survived the blast of the impact, they stood still on the edge of the deep crater. In the center was a smoldering body, coated in soot and dirt, and steaming slightly. The shinobi waited anxiously for their leader to arrive, since she had finally ran out of energy from her wounds and needed to be brought there by others. But to their utter confusion, the body moved, evidently out of conscious life. The body rose, slowly, just as Tsunade arrived on the scene. The figure finally made it to his feet, and pulled something out of his burnt-up clothing. He wrapped something around his forehead, and turned back to the Kanaha ninja, showcasing his own leaf headband. The crowd would have cheered, had they not seen the grave look on his face. The man moved, slowly, up the slope of the crater, and after several minutes finally made it to Tsunade. He looked into her face, grief and frustration clearly evident, as he spoke, revealing the pained, crippled voice of Naruto, H. Hoka Ge Sama. Th there's, some th thing you, and need, to KN now. Tsunade tried to use her hands to silence Naruto but it was in vain, as he struggled to take a breath in order to continue, T there is, a GR of IWA ninja, on th the OU outskirts of, the F fire coup country. Th the re planning on, invading. 
Naruto's strength seemed to have ended, as he fell to his knees and coughed up burnt blood. Tsunade wanted nothing more than to get every medic nin there and try to heal him, but she knew she'd need them for the supposed invasion. She looked down at Naruto as he slipped out of consciousness, regret clear in her eyes as she apologized, I'm so sorry Naruto, but I have to save our medics for the invasion. She let tears stream out of her eyes as she turned away from her dead or dying foster grandson. She took a while to regain her composure, but once she had she addressed her soldiers, you heard him. We will not let his sacrifice go to vain. We will protect this village with as much courage as he has just now. Sakura, you stay here with Naruto, try to sustain him for as long as possible, if he's even still alive. Tsunade began to choke up again as she said the last part, but managed to keep herself together, Kakashi, you take up command of Umbu again, the rest of you are with me. All academy graduates from this year, and any of you who are still in the academy are to get the civilian population into the shelters. Dismissed. Kakashi and his Umbu were gone the instant Tsunade had finished, while the academy graduates and students began to make their way back to the edge of the village. Tsunade and her group stayed where they were, as Tsunade gave her orders. Hyuga and attack types, front line. Long range support types, take up the Hokage monument and provide cover and support, via projectiles, or jutsu. Mid range types, go with Shizun, I will be among the front line. I will hear nothing of me not risking my own life. She gave the counselors who were about to speak up no room for questioning with her last order. Shizun, however, wasn't deterred, but Tsunade cut her off. I'm going to take a few soldier and plasma pills, so don't even start, Shizun. Her group nodded in understanding, and the mid and long range groups went their own ways, Shizun leading the mid group, and Tenten leading the long range group. Tsunade and the close range fighters, consisting majorly of Hyuga, mobilized, heading for the front gate. Sakura sat next to Naruto, constantly streaming chakra into his heart and brain, using everything she had to keep him alive. Naruto. You've done so much for me, for us. I know it's not much, but I'll do my best now to keep you alive, just as you did for me all those times. Sakura ended her reminiscent thoughts as she felt Naruto's condition change, she focused more on him and brought him back to stable, well, stable after all things considered. She continued streaming her chakra into Naruto for quite a long time, every so often picking up the sounds of battle from far off. She had already popped two soldier pills, and only had three left. She decided that she needed to patch herself up a little bit to avoid wasting any plasma pills on herself. She turned away from Naruto in order to analyze herself with more ease. After a few minutes of patchwork, mostly consisting of healing minor nicks and cuts, she turned back around, to find that Naruto was gone, leaving only a heap of ashes behind. On the front lines, IWA was taking heavy casualties at the uncharacteristic ferocity of the Hyuga, as well as the insane anger Tsunade was showcasing. The Umbu weren't making things any easier on them, as even Kakashi seemed to be fueled by rage and pain, and in many cases combined the Chidori and Reznan into one attack, which resulted in almost 50 deaths per use. Shizun and her mid-range fighters, on the other hand, were having some difficulty. It appeared that IWA had a lot of long and close range fighters, but less mid range fighters. Unfortunately, the long range fighters of Kanaha were completely distracted by Iwas, while the long range and mid range fighters of IWA were able to go at Kanaha's mid range fighters. Shizun herself was faring pretty well, but many of Kanaha's mid range fighters weren't suited to solely mid range fighting, as opposed to combined middle and close range fighting. Iwa's skilled mid-range fighters were taking full advantage of this, and wreaking havoc on Kanaha with it. As the battle continued, both armies detected several separate sets of large chakra sources, closing in on them from many directions. The battle slowed and finally came to a halt, as the two armies prepared themselves for the worst. Several tense minutes went by, before an IWA captain was encased in sand and crushed to death, his blood pooling at the bottom of the sandy coffin. Seconds later, a strangely colored kunao screamed through the battlefield, ripping through several IWA troops before embedding itself in a rock, after penetrating four trees and three other rocks. The IWA soldiers looked around frantically, as more of their troops were taken out from afar by sand and strange kunao. They finally got enough sense to split apart, and this action finally brought their new opponents out of hiding. 
Gara and his siblings appeared next to Tsunade. The four spoke no words, but a silent thank you from Tsunade and three silent no problem. S from the sand siblings went around, before another group showed their faces, each sporting slashed sound headbands. Tsunade and the Kanaha ninja were put back on their guard, as they stared curiously at the new faces. The girl in the group smiled brightly, before she and her two male comrades leapt into the center of the frenzying IWA nin, slashing and stabbing away at them. Kanaha eased up slightly, before preparing to get back into the fray, only just realizing that the sand siblings had beaten them to it. This show of confidence and courage sparked a huge morale boost in Kanaha's ninja, and they reinitialized the fight with a renewed vigor. The tide of the battle began to shift with the new allies Kanaha had received, and after almost two hours of this fighting, Iwa's forces had been cut in half twice. The battle was beginning to look like a great victory for Kanaha, but that was when everything changed for the worse, when two more large groups were sensed, and this time, Iwa's forces weren't scared, in fact, they looked overjoyed at the feeling of the new chakra sources. Kanaha's forces retreated a small distance, as two groups of shinobi leapt to Iwa's aid, one group bearing the symbol of Komagakur, and the other bearing the mark of the late Odagakur. Tsunade growled at the newcomers, Kyumagakur, Iwagakur, and the remnants of Odagakur are all in on this with Akatsuki. Shit. There's little to no hope of us winning after the first siege. Tsunade's troops seemed to have come to similar conclusions, but in true Kanaha fashion, none of them were going to let this deter them from protecting their home and their loved ones. Plus, they had to make it up to Naruto in any way they can, and they were pretty sure that ensuring he had a home to come back to, should he survive, was definitely something worth doing. Tsunade sighed as she collected her thoughts and calmed her emotions, everyone. We are now vastly outnumbered. Continue fighting, but be much more defensive and cautious. Do not throw your lives away uselessly. Her ninja all nodded in understanding, and the outnumbered army leapt into action, as did the three allied enemies. The war heated up quickly, and Kanaha was faring pretty well, all things considered. But, even with Kanaha's skill and determination, in war, numbers often mean advantages, and that was especially true in this case. Kanaha's casualties were rising steadily, and although the alliance of enemies they were facing were taking far more casualties, they also had many times the number of shinobi to lose. Tsunade retreated from the fight she had just finished with the IWH Yunin, who now had a large dent where his face had been previously, and signaled for her long-range fighters to get closer and start using both long- and medium-range attacks. The long-range fighters complied, and Kanaha's efforts quickly gained momentum, and the Oto slash Kumo slash IWA alliance, I'm going to refer to this as the alliance from now on, bear with me, as I know they're more like the axis of World War II than the alliance, but alliance is more fitting in this scenario, took some heavy casualties as they tried to respond and reform to combat the new scenario they were taking on. This short burst of momentum and favorability of Kanaha did not last, however, as the alliance was, if nothing else, good at innovating and adapting, and as such, quickly turned the tide of battle back in their favor, using Kanaha's new tactic against them, by distracting the ranged fighters and having close-range fighters take them out with shuriken, kunao, or even teijutsu. Kanaha's ranged squad was diminishing rapidly, and if it went, so did Kanaha's hope for a semi-safe retreat, as the allied long-range fighters would pick them off with ease. Tsunade had to start contemplating a full retreat, when it happened. In a swirl of black fire, three men appeared in the center of the battlefield, and the combatants on both sides of the war leapt away out of reflex, kicking up a shroud of dust. Tsunade's heart raced until she heard Suzuki's voice, Amaterasu. Tsunade glanced at her opponents, and saw an entire squad engulfed by the black flames of hell cast out by Suzuki's apparent Mungakyushari Nan. But what happened next utterly shocked, confused, and troubled Tsunade to no end, Suzuki darted out of the smoke, a ball of swirling blue chakra in his hand, and a white ball of electricity in the other, and yelled, Chidori. As he plunged the crackling ball into a IWA captain, and raised Nan. As he took out a small squad of Otonin with the fourth's most famous attack. That shocking event was dulled by another Amaterasu emerging and slamming into a Kumo platoon, which scattered to reduce casualties. The attack itself wasn't as surprising as the voice a few of Kanaha's shinobi recognized, the voice of Ataki Uchiha. Sure enough, when some of the dust had settled, 
Suzuki and Itaka stood on opposite sides of the semicircle-like clearing created when the armies had retreated. The two brothers looked first to each other, then to Tsunade, and finally to where they had, Tsunade Tha, Shunshine Tu, where the dust was finally settling and clearing, revealing the third figure they first saw. The figure seemed to have on an oversized trench coat, and a large scroll strapped to his back, as well as shoulder-length hair, but colors could not be distinguished yet from the smoke. Tsunade's mind went into overdrive for a moment, then nearly shut down, leaving one thought to ring around in her head, th the fourth. Surely enough, when the dust fully cleared, the sight that was revealed to her could only be described as a mini fourth hookage, as the figure was wearing either the fourth's cloak, or a perfect copy of it, and had blonde, spiky hair reaching just under his shoulder blades. The scroll on his back was something Tsunade definitely recognized, the toad scroll, and Kakashi seemed to think it was along the same lines, but Tsunade knew that the toad scroll was Jiraiya's, and could not be passed down so quickly after the last owner had died. So what could this summoning scroll possibly be? Neither Kakashi nor Tsunade had an answer, so they watched, along with the rest of the shinobi present, as the figure turned and revealed to Kanaha his leaf headband, which the alliance had already seen, for the most part. The headband itself wasn't what brought tears to Tsunade's eyes, however. It was the man's face, the face of the Naruto she knew and loved like a brother slash son. However, the eyes she saw were not the carefree, loving ones she first met, nor the pained, intelligent ones she had seen when he first returned with Suzuki. No, his eyes were the cold eyes of a warrior heading into war, eyes she had seen many times in her lifetime. Eyes she hated to see in people so young, and eyes she had hoped she would never see in Naruto. The alliance stood still, as the man they saw in the center of the clearing brought an intense fear and hatred back into Iwa's men, the man that had caused so much pain in their lives, and instilled so much fear into their friends, family, and comrades. The man who had cost them the third shinobi war, the man they believed to be the fourth Hokage. Oto and Kumo were similar, although no nation held the deep hatred and fear of the fourth, and, by extension, albeit more hatred than fear, Kanaha, as IWA did. The armies tensed as the man's mouth opened, and a voice they couldn't quite place as the fourths emerged, I will give you all one last chance to retreat and save your miserable lives. Decline, and I will assure you, you will all die here today, by either my or my comrade's hands. You need not give me an answer, just leave. Now. IWA wasted no time, they were gone in a flash, although Kumo seemed to be still thinking it over, while some of Oto's less experienced, and less knowledgeable seemed to be enraged, and in fact, several swarmed around Naruto, and seven of them leapt into the air, and before they could slash their various weapons into the man, a puff of smoke surrounded him, and a large bear slashed two men and bit another, while a wolf clawed one in the chest, killing him instantly, and slashed, then bit another. Man's face. A third animal, this one a tiger, finished the other two with quick slashes of his claws. The crowd stood and looked on in a mix of horror, awe, and shock, as the animals poofed out of existence as fast as they had appeared, and they noticed the man hadn't moved a muscle, indicating either speed the sherry non couldn't even register, or an outsider summoning them, but summoning from afar was unheard of, and, as far as anyone knows, impossible. This revelation rocked the Oto and Kumo shinobi enough to know it was time to retreat, and the two armies did exactly that, leaving the Kanaha ninja to recover in safety. Several tense minutes passed, before the crowd watched in horror as Naruto collapsed into a heap, and Itake and Suzuki rushed to his side, as did Tsunade and Kakashi. Unbeknownst to Tsunade, Sakura had arrived moments before Naruto, Suzuki, and Itake had, and had seen the whole thing. She quickly made her way through the crowd, and to Tsunade, where she kneeled down beside Naruto as the others were. Tsunade gave her a glance of anger and disappointment, to which she returned a look of confusion, regret, and a look that asked for forgiveness. Tsunade's look returned to one of worry over Naruto, indicating she would talk to Sakura about it later. Tsunade signaled for a medical team, and one promptly brought over a stretcher, which Naruto was gently placed onto. Kanaha's gathered shinobi spread out to let the stretcher and Naruto's closest friends walk through, back toward Kanaha. It took nearly 20 minutes at the group's slow pace, but they finally reached what had used to be Kanaha's main gate which they quickly moved through, winding their way through the streets of Kanaha, which quickly flooded with the returning civilians and shinobi. The group moved toward the tower, 
which had been converted, at least partially, into a medical center when Naruto had first returned, as Tsunade had predicted an attack from the remaining Akatsuki. The civilians moved to the side to let the group pass, and as they laid eyes on the man riding the stretcher, one emotion began to grip all of Kanaha's civilians, and surprisingly, it was shared by most of the shinobi, as well. Naruto woke up in a makeshift hospital room, his head spinning and his entire body sore enough to have gone one-on-one -on -one with a steamroller, and lost. It took a while, but he finally managed to get used to the constant pain and the spinning in his head, and managed to sit up. He used his new vantage point to look around the room he was in, and he saw the sleeping forms of Sakura, Suzuki, Hinata, Tsunade, Shizun, and Iruka. He smiled to himself, and noticed his clothing hung up in the corner. His face regained its seriousness, and he picked himself up off the bed. He stumbled his way over to his clothes, and quickly changed before anyone woke up. He moved over to the couches his friends were now using as multi-person beds, and was about to wake them up, when a horrible chakra surged over the land, paralyzing him and waking up the other occupants of the room, as well as the rest of Kanaha. The six sleeping forms quickly bolted upright and analyzed their situation before they too were paralyzed by the power and killing intent that was freely flowing over the village. The three older shinobi recognized this power, as did Naruto and Suzuki, Sakura and Hinata vaguely recognized it as well. In mere moments the streets of Kanaha were chaos, with citizens and shinobi scrambling around in every direction imaginable, yes, some people were flying straight up at times. Eventually some order and sense came to the people, and they began to flood to the Hokage Tower to find out what they should do. As the sounds of the pandemonium increased, the seven worn-out shinobi were released from their paralyzed states. They quickly made their way to the roof of the tower, which, Naruto noticed, seemed to be a floor or two lower than he remembered, and were greeted with flooded streets of people looking up at the Hokage expectantly. The crowd quickly noticed Naruto, and some murmuring began. For the first time in a long while, Tsunade's brain had completely shut down from confusion and shock. She stood there, looking out over her citizens, opening and closing her mouth uselessly. Naruto noticed this, and decided to save her. He moved forward, and pushed her out of the limelight. He cleared his throat, and his still in pain voice rang out over the village. Everyone. Please, quiet down. I can't pretend to understand what is happening, Although I do have my ideas, but I can assure you that I was not lying when I last came here, the Kyuabai is dead, and I did not deceive you when you were allowed to glimpse my mind. I ask all of you to please head to the war shelters as quickly, quietly, and orderly as possible, and I will personally make sure that whatever this new threat is, it is defeated before it can cause any more damage to our ravaged village. Naruto's voice had steadily grown stronger during his short speech, and the crowd was moved. However, what happened next brought Naruto new levels of confusion, and brought a great sense of pride into Kanaha's shinobi. What the hell is wrong with you Naruto? Came the voice of a man in the crowd. Yeah. Look at you. You're all beat up. You can't expect to fight in your shape. Came another's voice. Come on. Have some faith in us, would ya? Let us handle this one, you go back to sleep. Came a third voice, and this one seemed to bring smirks to the faces of everyone in the crowd. Naruto was at a loss for words, and was about to call their bluff when the village's citizens mobilized, beginning to head for where the source of this power surge was believed to be. Before Naruto could say anything else, four lightning bolts struck four different points outside the village, and, to everyone's surprise, they sustained themselves, and moved with what were apparently people. Naruto's brain registered a far-off memory from some scroll or book he had once read, Limelight, a very ancient, powerful jutsu used by four of the Fire Nation's strongest shinobi. Known to be the most powerful lightning jutsu ever created, capable of destroying anything inside the circle the four shinobi create. Last known usage, over 50 years ago. Naruto's heart nearly stopped when he had finally made a coherent thought out of the memory. He focused chakra into his throat and cleared it again, getting everyone's attention, even Tsunade's, everyone. I thank you for what you are willing to try to do, but I believe this is a little bit out of the League of Non-Shinobi. I have a vague idea as to what is about to happen, and I can't even do this on my own, at full power. I ask you all, again, 
to head to the war shelters, and I ask all shinobi of Chiryun in rank or higher to meet me on this roof within the next five minutes. I do not want any arguing, now get moving. Naruto's booming voice did just that, no one dared to argue, no matter how much they wanted to prove themselves to the boy they had wronged all their lives. Five minutes passed, and most of the citizen population had made it to the shelters, while all the shinobi he had called for had indeed met him on the roof. Naruto had been keeping his eye on the four moving lightning bolts, and noticed that two of them had stopped moving, completely across the village from each other. One of the other ones was moving through the village, toward the tower, while the other was still moving toward what used to be the main gate of Kanaha. He surmised that he had about three minutes until the preparations were in place. He had to move quickly. Okay everyone, here's the deal. Those four lightning bolts are trying to surround the village roughly evenly. If they manage to do so, Kanaha will be gone, forever. We need four squads to mobilize and deal with these shinobi. It matters not who goes where, just that at least one of the teams manages to defeat their assigned opponent. I suspect that this is all just a hopeful diversion, and that the power we feel off in the distance is the real attack. Do not tread lightly, however, as this diversion is still very dangerous. I am assigning Team Guy along with Attacka to head west. I want Teams 8 and 7, minus myself, to head east. Team Asuma, along with Tsunade, you are to wait for the southbound lightning bolt. Umbu will head north to cut off the fourth. I will take out the primary attack source, understood. A chorus of high reverberated through the tower, and the tower shuddered as the shinobi on the roof leapt off as fast as possible, simultaneously. That left only Naruto on the battered Hokage tower. He gave one last grim look around the village, before he shunshined away, past the main gate, and partway into the forest surrounding the village. He stood still for a moment, and scanned the area for the chakra source. It took a little while, but he finally managed to pinpoint the location. He wasted no time, and double-timed it to a clearing he estimated at two and a half kilometers away. Team Guy moved into position first, and were met with the grim sight of a waiting revived corpse. The revived shinobi looked over at the five assembled shinobi, and smirked. Another lightning bolt struck off in the distance, and the six combatants disappeared in the blink of an eye. A loud clang could be heard, and in a moment the six shinobi reappeared, five of them trying to slash the sixth from any number of ways, but lightning bolt blades seemed to emanate from the sixth's body, blocking each and every blow, and then electrocuting the assailants. The five teammates poofed out of existence, and five logs fell to the ground, burned to a crisp. The five Kanaha ninja regrouped, and a silent conversation went down in an instant, and everyone seemed to have figured out that that must have been this revived man's main ability. Itaka was the first to actually speak, this will not be easy, but I think I have a plan, or at least an idea. I need you four to distract him long enough for me to get enough energy into my main Jakyushari non to use Amaterasu. I doubt his lightning defense can stop the flames of hell, but when I give you the signal, you have to get out of the way as I won't be able to call off the flames from the original target. If you're close enough to him, you could be badly burnt, or even consumed by the fire itself. You guys can do whatever you feel is necessary to distract him, but I think Tenton might be the best for this role. Team Guy thought it over for a few seconds before they agreed, silently. Guy and Lee activated three gates each, while Niji activated his Byakugan, and Tenton pulled out two slightly oversized scrolls. The four Mansell leapt away from Itake, who had his eyes closed, obviously concentrating. He took several seconds to concentrate, before he managed to succeed in his first stage of the plan, Manja Kyushari Nan. Escaped his lips, before his mouth and eyes closed once again, and his face contorted once again in the strains of concentration. Team Guy re-emerged to show themselves to their silent opponent. Lee and Guy immediately charged the Ma Dash, strike that, zombie. The two twins sped out of sight of the naked human eye, and a second later two punches connected with the reanimated corpse. The man was sent flying backwards, and it took several seconds for him to re-emerge and retake his position of defensive waiting. Lee and Guy reappeared, obviously frustrated. Apparently, they also had burnt hands, as they were both rubbing them subconsciously. Niji took this as his sign to try, and ran forward, Byakugan blazing, and Jiyukin posed to strike. 
Niji's mouth opened and a few barely audible words escaped his mouth as he neared his opponent, 8 trigrams, 128 palms. He finished his jutsu's name as he reached his opponent and used his momentum to quickly deliver the first few stages of the attack, 2 palm, 4 palm, 8 palm, 16 palm. Niji's hands blurred out of vision nearing his 16 palm strike, 32 palm. Niji began to move his body to increase the speed of his blows, 64 palm. Niji's voice began to strain from the pain and stress of this continued motion, 128 palm. Niji's entire body was blurry as he struck all of the dead man's tenkitsu, chakra points, right, in a mere second. Niji finished his strike and leapt back out of sight with the last of his momentum. The man he hit staggered a bit, and some black fluid escaped his lips, but he quickly regained his composure, and stood at the ready once again. Team Guy let their mouths fall open slightly, amazed at how little Niji's most powerful attack had done. Niji promptly let his Byakugan fade and fell to one knee, clearly having used up a bit too much chakra. Tenten grimaced, and brought her two scrolls into view, stretching her arms out straight in front of her before she grabbed a small string between two fingers on either hand, and let the scrolls unravel as she brought her hands up in an arc over her head. She slowly began to spin, before she jumped up into the air, and increased her speed to keep her aloft. She finally smeared a small amount of blood onto each of her strange scrolls, before calling out, sharpened hailstorm. A truly scary number of blades shot out of her scrolls, ranging in size from senbon needles to 30 pound two hand swords. Team Guy watched in amazement as Tenten fell down between her two still spinning, still spitting scrolls. As the first of the blades reached the resurrected shinobi, his lightning defense picked up, and the group was quickly blinded by the sheer number of lightning bolts emanating from him. The group's hearts fell even more as they heard the blades being deflected. Several seconds passed before the light faded and they were able to get a glimpse of what remained. Tenten growled in frustration as only 14 of her blades, mostly Senbon at that, had managed to embed themselves in the man's skin. She was, however, slightly more satisfied at how almost 30 more had apparently grazed the man's skin, leaving deep cuts all over his body. The man lost his smirk, and began a series of hand signs, before calling out, Forbidden Jutsu, Limelight 2. Team Guy was completely confused, and had feared that the other three had gotten into position, but to their horror, a highly focused bolt of lightning began to form on the man's chest, and immediately shot out at Tenten, who had no way to dodge or defend herself, as she was caught up in the dangerous electricity. After several seconds, a poof was heard, and a log was seen smashing into another tree. Team Guy's spirits rose, as they hoped that Tenten was perfectly fine, but Tenten appeared seconds later in midair, before falling to the ground, unconscious. Guy looked on fearfully as most of Tenten's exposed skin had been burnt to a crisp, while most of her clothing seemed to be burned as well. A glint caught everyone's eye, as a lone kunao shot out at their opponent. Guy quickly took action, as he scooped up Tenten, and motioned for Lee to grab Niji. Lee complied and they quickly leapt away. Seconds later, the slightly confused zombie heard, Amaterasu, and looked toward where the kunao had been sent from only to see black flames consuming him as he melted back into the ground. Team 7 and Team 8 emerged in a clearing just east of the Kanaha wall. There stood a strange man who neither Kakashi nor Kurane could identify, other than the fact that he seemed to be a revived corpse. Hinata wasted no time in activating her Byakugan, while Suzuki activated his Sherry Non. Kiba and Akamaru could be heard sniffing around, and Kiba quickly made a report, no other sense nearby. Low chance of this being a bunshin or something, little note a chance of backup arriving to assist him. Kurane and Kakashi nodded. Shino then made his own report, I don't think my bugs would be willing to attack this man, as they are not fond of eating decayed flesh like this. I may be able to summon up some insects that are willing to do so, but do not count on it. I am afraid I may not be much assistance for this battle. Kurane and Kakashi were slightly confused at this, but they figured Shino knew far far, far more about bugs than they did, so they let it go. Sakura then decided to pitch in, if his body really is decayed then I should be able to just punch him into oblivion, right? Sakura seemed to be unsure, and Kakashi decided that she may be right to be cuacious, perhaps, but we can't be sure that this man is really as brittle as we believe. 
Best to hold off on that until we figure out if he has some sort of defensive jutsu that could cause you difficulty. For right now, I want you to stay back and be prepared to heal anyone that gets injured. Sakura nodded, and Kakashi turned to Kurane and Hinata, are the two of you any good at combined distractive genjutsu? He received a nod, a surprisingly confident one from Hinata, he noted, alright then, could you try to set up a disorientating one so that me and Suzuki, and maybe Kiba if Chidori doesn't work, can start to assault him to probe for defenses and weaknesses. Another nod. Alright, then, Suzuki, let's go. Suzuki nodded, and the two leapt off as soon as Hinata and Kurane had stopped forming hand seals and chanting softly. Suzuki threw a series of kunao around their silent corpse-like opponent. He then pulled on strings he had had attached and bound the man to a tree trunk. He blurred through some hand seals before calling out his jutsu. Fire style, dragon fire jutsu. True to the jutsu's name, Suzuki seemed to breathe fire, as the strings were quickly engulfed and the man was quickly shrouded by the raging flames. Suzuki smirked, that was just too EA dash, before he could finish, electricity seemingly came out of nowhere, severing all the wires and letting the flaming cord fall to the ground, revealing a barely harmed zombie. Suzuki grimaced, before more of the airborne electricity formed, and quickly shocked Suzuki, who let out a yelp of pain. Sakura ran over to Suzuki and began to heal his burnt skin. Kakashi grunted in annoyance, and motioned for Kiba to come over. Kiba and Akamaru nodded, well, Akamaru barked, and Kiba got down on all fours, and Akamaru proceeded to jump onto Kiba's back, beast mimicry, man-beast clones. Kiba's slightly feral voice could be heard before a poof of smoke covered Akamaru and Kiba, and when it cleared there were two Kibas standing next to each other, smirking. Kakashi smiled to Kiba, and nodded for him to proceed while he began to go through some hand seals. Kiba nodded back, and he and Akamaru got down on all fours again before Kiba yelled, Fang over Fang. Kiba and Akamaru disappeared to give way to two swirling masses of angry, claw-bearing dog. The canine hurricane slammed into the revived Fire Nation fighter, and they seemed to have more success than Suzuki. They slammed into his side and took off the man's arms. Kakashi smirked, as he began to charge the man. He got close and leapt up into the air, Chidori. Kakashi plunged his lightning ball fist into the corpse's chest, and lightning surged around Kakashi's body, about to strike him down, but the Chidori seemed to have worked, and the man's body began to crumble. The electricity that was forming around Kakashi faded slowly dissipated as the man's body broke down and crumbled back into dust. Kakashi smirked in success, as Kurane and Hinata released their genjutsu. The squad of Umbu had finally arrived at the northern spot just as the fourth lightning bolt had, but right as the Umbu were getting ready to leap into combat, the man wobbled, fell to his hands and knees, and then melted back into the ground. The Umbu looked around confused for a few moments, before realization dawned on them, and the Umbu captain spoke up, ah, one of the other teams must have beaten their opponent. Like Naruto-sama said, it didn't matter who beat their opponent first, just that someone did. It looks like we're not needed here anymore, let's move on and try to assist Naruto-sama. The captain got nods and agreements from his squad and they proceeded to leap out of sight once again. Team Asuma along with Tsunade finally saw their assigned opponent come around a corning and into sight. Tsunade wasted no time, and she jumped high up into the air, before concentrating a good deal of her chakra into her fist, and she collided with a melting corpse, much to her surprise. She couldn't pull back her chakra fast enough, and her fist collided with the ground, leaving a very large crater nearly the size of the one Naruto had created upon his impact merely hours before. Tsunade stood back up and dusted herself off, before looking over toward Team Asuma, who seemed to be confused as well. It seemed to dawn on Shikamaru first what had happened, I think that means that one of the other teams beat their guy first, so that meant either the other guys were defeated too automatically, or, more likely, whoever resurrected these guys released the jutsu. The other four thought this over and seemed to agree, but this led Eno to a new question, well, what now? Do we go back to the hospital and help all the injured Jounin and Chiyunin, or go help Naruto? Shikamaru thought it over for a while, and came up with another answer, it'd probably take us too long to catch up with Naruto, we might as well try to help others heal up, right Tsunade-sama? Tsunade merely nodded, and the group set off for the Kanaha hospital. Naruto finally reached the site of the large chakra surge that woke up Kanaha. 
he came upon an old man who wielded a staff and a young boy, probably around Naruto's age, who had a red cloak and three tails formed around him. He looked at the boy's face, and gasped in surprise. Sara. That's the end of this part guys if you want the next part then like subscribe and leave a comment saying so. This is Maelstrom signing off.